Hello everyone, let me welcome you to yet another session of the NPTEL course, The History of English Language and Literature. In today's session, we shall be engaging with Restoration Drama. Restoration Drama, as we have noted before, it is perhaps the most notable artistic production of the period and it is also the best known of the period. So, as we begin, let us take a quick look at the shifting literary trends in English uh, theatre from the Elizabethan times onwards. Uh, we have also noticed through a discussion of the socio-political uh, background that framed a particular literary and artistic tendencies that most of these uh, shifting tendencies and these shifting loyalties were also largely dependent on whoever was the country's ruler at particular points of time. And we also uh, noticed that whoever was in power also controlled all kinds of laws, morality, fashion and also dictated what was uh, popular and acceptable uh, for each period. Uh, in that sense, we see a transition from the Elizabethan times onwards. Uh, for instance, Queen Elizabeth I, she loved theatre and promoted all kinds of arts. We so also find theatre flourishing during this time. James I, he continues to promote art and literature. Uh, with Charles I, he never, was, uh, uh, he never was against the promotion of art and literature. We also find a sense of Jacobian drama continuing to exist during that time. But also, there is a significant decline that ensues uh, during uh, this time uh, because of the uh, various struggles of the monarch with the parliament, the civil war that followed, the beheading of the king. And we also find uh, the commonwealth getting created under the uh, leadership of uh, Oliver Cromwell. And under his rule, we also find that uh, the theatre activity had completely closed down with the closure of theatres in 1642. And the Puritan government also had uh, put an end to all kinds of entertainment in England during that point of time. With the uh, restoration of the Stuart uh, monarchy with uh, the Charles II assuming the throne of uh, England, we also find theatres getting uh, rebuilt, the acting companies are reinstated and entertainment becomes stronger than ever. And there is also a predominant French influence which begins to dictate the fashion of the period, the literary tendencies of the period. And we also notice that Charles II and with the restoration of the theatre, there is a certain kind of uh, prolific production of drama and all kinds of art forms, especially after the suppression of uh, a little more than a decade. So, we do find that this uh, uh, England after restoration, it begins on a fresh note and although not uh, uh, altogether accepted by uh, all, all the historians and all the critics of the time, but we also find that uh, a new phase gets inaugurated in terms of drama. So, this phase also comes into being after uh, the dearth of theatrical productions from 1642 to 1660. So, in that sense, drama after the event of uh, the restoration of Stuart uh, dynasty, we also find an inevitable reaction against the Puritan manners and morals. So, uh, there is also a certain uh, significant uh, things that happen during this time, it's characterized by the return of the Cavaliers, the supporters of the uh, Royalists primarily. They were exiled in France and they have returned and as Hudson notes it, with their return, there was a different kind of moral ambience which was getting generated in England. Uh, they encouraged hedonistic liveliness, infidelity and profligacy became fashionable, moral ideals turned into jest and domestic virtue was ridiculed. So, this was the um, moral and uh, social scene in uh, London, uh, in England particularly in London after the return of the Cavaliers from the exile. And the court of Charles II also promoted all of these uh, vices and allow me to read a passage from Hudson. Uh, Hudson describes the court of Charles II as uh, the most shameless ever known. He goes on to say, it was the scene of much pleasure, liberty and scandal and the centre of patronage for politics, fashion, literature, art, learning, invention, company promoting and a hundred other activities of the king's eager subjects seeking notoriety or reward. So, this was the scene in uh, the court of Charles II. This also provokes us to take a look at the kind of life Charles II was leading. He is generally known as the merry monarch of England. Uh, on a lighter note, many historians also feel that he was the one who brought back partying to England and he uh, promoted liveliness and hedonism in his court. And his uh, lifestyle was also quite promiscuous and we find that uh, he had at least 12 illegitimate children through various mistresses and uh, all of these licenses were not considered very acceptable either. And he had no legal heir incidentally. And he was the one who granted the theatre licences in, uh, uh, in, in England and he also uh, with the dictum required that uh, the female parts be played by their natural performers, uh, women themselves and not by adolescent boys as it used to happen in the Elizabethan and the Jacobian times. So, a lot of change uh, had already begun with the uh, restoration of Charles II. 
At this point, uh, we cannot begin our discussion without taking a look at who comprised the court wits. Court wits uh, were a set of uh, people who were uh, who were part and parcel of Charles II's court. They were primarily poets and dramatists, and they were also gentlemen amateurs, and they uh, had their own kinds of uh, amusements, and they also used to amuse Charles II incredibly. And, and uh, very often, it, it was said about them that they were their own uh, first audience, so they did not really write for the uh, public or for the commoners, unlike the earlier. Uh, writers and artists, but they performed only for their own kind in front of their friends, in front of the court and most of these uh, performances were not made public either. And they were also patrons of humbler writers who existed in uh, England during that time. And the most important of the court wit was John Wilmot, the Earl of Rochester. He was considered as a wit and a rake of the first order and he was also considered as a leader of the court wits. In fact, much of restoration comedy, it was modeled on this character of Rochester who uh, is said to have caught the fancy of uh, many during those times. The other important uh, court wits were uh, George Villiers, Charles Sackville, Sir Charles Sedley, John Sheffield, Sir Carr Scrobb, Sir George Etheridge and William Wycherley. A couple of them we shall come back to take a look at when we talk about restoration comedy. They otherwise dominated the cultural scene of uh, uh, London to such an extent that it was not possible to talk about entertainment without having a reference to these court wits. And these court wits, because of the lavish uh, lifestyle and the extravagant uh, lifestyle that they enjoyed, and also because of the uh, because of the popularity and rather the notoriety that they had in London, they continue to appear in many of their own plays, or even many of uh, the other plays were also modeled on the real life characters of uh, these uh, court wits. So this was not seen as uh, a bad thing by them. They also kind of enjoyed this kind of popularity, or rather the notoriety that uh, they had in uh, London at the point of time. And because of these. Uh, varied reason some historians for instance Hudson he uh, is of the opinion that one need not give much space to this part of our subject and his uh, argument being the theatre was now almost wholly the creature of the demoralized world of fashions and it everywhere reflected the taste of its patrons. For this reasons, many historians during those times as well as the later times, they do not feel it uh, quite appropriate to include uh, these uh, uh, theatrical activities into the literary history because it also included a history of the uh, amorous adventures and the sexual adventures that most of these court wets uh, uh, had. Having said that, Hudson briefly talks about the restoration, uh, the comedy of the restoration period and he only makes a very brief mention in just in a couple of paragraphs about uh, uh, William Wycherley and his uh, work The Country Wife, uh, William Congrave, Sir uh, John Vanbrugh, George Farquhar. So uh, other than that, we do not find a prolific discussion of the uh, restoration drama in Hudson or in, uh, for, for that matter, for in most of the leading uh, early uh, historical writings. So, the, the, the restoration drama in general, it was uh, characterized by an open and unabashed indecency. It also revealed the spirit of the society for whose amusement it was uh, produced. So, uh, maybe this was a result of the uh, continued repression and suppression of the uh, decade old, old rule under the Puritan uh, government led by Oliver Cromwell. It is not to say that this uh, kind of drama uh, was free from criticisms. Even during those times, it drew a lot of flack, a lot of criticism from uh, eminent uh, people of those uh, times. Uh, the most important one being the tremendous castigation that it received from uh, J Reverend Jeremy Collier. He published a short view of the profaneness and immorality of the English stage in 1698. And this work, it was an immense sensation and it had a salutary effect in England then. It was also instrumental in rousing uh, public opinion against uh, such kind of theatre which displayed and celebrated uh, indecency and unabashed immorality. So, this uh, work by uh, Reverend uh, Collier, it also condemned the mockery of the clergy in uh, these uh, comedies. Uh, it also condemned the kind of uh, lopsided portrayal of the upper class uh, lifestyle and also it objected the uh, sexual innuendos and the profanity which was uh, quite dominant and also enjoyed by the people of the times. And, and he makes this uh, observation in his writing right at the outset, being convinced that nothing has gone farther in debauching the age than the stage poets and playhouse, I thought I could not employ my time better than in writing against them. So, this uh, plea was not uh, unnoticed. In uh, fact, uh, the result was that a royal order prohibiting the acting of anything contrary to religion and good manners was uh, uh, issued shortly. But however, censorship became an official policy uh, only after about four decades. 
uh, in spite of these many uh, criticisms against uh, restoration drama and restoration comedy in particular, uh, modern critics also consider that this uh, uh, entire field and this entire genre uh, is a, a critic's uh, chimera. There are a lot of recent works which have begun to take a look at the private lives of these uh, court wits and also the uh, writers of the restoration comedy and to try and understand uh, the kind of uh, drama that they produced and the effect that they, it had on the uh, restoration society. Uh, particularly the early period of uh, Charles II's rule. Moving on, let's take a quick look at uh, what constituted restoration theatre. It was a very different audience that uh, went to watch these plays. It was mostly upper class. It was not the kind of uh, uh, plays that they were enjoyed by uh, the Elizabethan and the Jacobian audience. And the theatre was also quite modern in the sense that uh, there was uh, uh, the presence of a lot of modern props such as uh, the modern uh, uh, picture frame stage actresses were part of it, uh, not just actors. There was the presence of movable scenery, uh, artificial lighting. So, if you remember in the Elizabethan and the Jacobian times, one could not stage a play uh, after a sundown or one required candles, uh, which uh, was rather expensive. Theatre also moves indoors from the outdoor public playhouses. This was primarily to cater to the elite and uh, these were also uh, private theatres or not public playhouses like the Elizabethan and the Jacobian times. Uh, the two major licensed theatres in London during those times were the Theatre Royal and the Duke's House. And these were also, uh, let me reiterate, uh, theatres indoor catered to the elite courtiers. It's not to say that Shakespeare and Marlowe had completely gone out of fashion. We also find a lot of adaptations by Shakespeare and Marlowe during uh, this time. Uh, many of their plays were also adapted to suit contemporary tastes and political uh, needs. It was, um, we also noticed the influence of Ben Jonson considerably, especially in the comedy of humours which uh, make a comeback during this period as well. We find that with the interest displayed also on the comedy of manners, there is an emphasis on social acceptability as well. Plays are also staged and adapted in order to uh, suit and uh, to this uh, sort of acceptability. For instance, there is this uh, particular adaptation made by Nahum Tate, uh, which was a reworking of King Lear by Shakespeare. Uh, we find that the play had a happy ending contrary to Shakespeare's original play. Also, the uh, violent gory scene which included the blinding of uh, Gluster was uh, completely removed in order to uh, save the agony uh, of the present uh, viewers. We also noticed that the restoration comedy reflected not the real social world but the ideal social world of the court wits of uh, Charles II. And this was also a, a sort of a halfway house between Elizabethan theatre and the theatre of the early uh, 19th and early 20th century. Uh, we did not find a complete uh, break from the Elizabethan and Jacobian uh, period. Uh, for example, as we noted, a strong influence of uh, Ben Johnson continues to prevail and also uh, there is this uh, typical restoration uh, wit combat between the sexes which was modelled on uh, uh, some of Ben Johnson's uh, uh, comedy of manners as well. Uh, so, uh, in spite of all of these things which were uh, built into uh, the theatre of the restoration period, we find that it was uh, mostly mostly catering to the uh, taste of an upper class uh, court wit audience and also we find uh, significantly an admiration and imitation of French wit. If you remember, uh, French uh, taste dominated the European scene as well. But in spite of this uh, predominant influence of the French in the restoration drama, we find that it is also inherently English. This kind of drama also promoted a pseudo courtly ideal uh, in England, particularly focused in London. And this is in stark contrast with the knightly code that existed in the works of uh, uh, Spencer and Sidney. And in that sense, it also promoted the kind of lives and the lifestyle that uh, were enjoyed by the court wits of the time. As we noted with the dictum of Charles II, women were allowed to uh, play a part on the stage, but they, they got lesser wages than that of men. And many of the male actors of the times uh, of, of those time, we also uh, notice that they become playwrights as well, but we do not find this transition happening in many uh, women. Uh, uh, there's only a couple of names uh, which are mentioned, especially that of Charlotte Clark, who was an actress and she is said to have written three plays. There was very little dramatic activity outside London. And uh, the playhouses uh, which existed during that time, uh, the private playhouses, they were seen as the centre of uh, vice and exhibitionism and it was also seen as a place which had to be avoided by respectable citizens of the time. And there was no relation uh, to the real world of uh, uh, England during the time. Uh, it was a very ideal kind of a world that the court would enjoy to have. 
and in that sense it was also a world of wish fulfillment uh, and uh, it, it was also the, the world which focused on creating an ideal wit and an ideal rake nothing of the uh, knightly code or the knightly conduct of the Spenserian and the, uh, the earlier Elizabethan times. This uh, perhaps of all of these reasons put together this kind of drama had a very short lived uh, effect with no lasting impact on uh, literature. We also find that this uh, more than the positive things it had done more harm uh, particularly because there was a hostile kind of attitude that developed in, uh, in England at least for a, a while and there, it was also uh, considered that well brought up young people uh, were not supposed to visit these sort of play houses or to engage with this kind of drama. So coming to talk about the particular kinds of genres of drama that existed uh, in England during that time the most important one uh, was restoration comedy. So, restoration comedy was no uh, different from the kind of uh, things that uh, the court wits promoted. It uh, promoted amoral wit and stylized uh, hedonism. It was confined to London. In that sense, it was uh, a very metropolitan kind of uh, drama and literature. It had no relation uh, or, or any kind of relatability to the provincial uh, cultures and it was also not popular outside London. And we also find in most of these plays there is an, an universal kind of praise being showered on the city of London and also the, uh, the people who are uh, from outside uh, the city of London they are also ridiculed and there is also pronounced detestation of the countryside. And we find uh, in these plays at least most of these plays a portrayal of a marriage as an institution quite boring and restrictive and it also uh, highlights and even celebrates the carnality. Uh, follies and vices which exist outside the institution of marriage and there is also a celebration of adultery, sexual attraction and also uh, sexual conquest which was considered quite a uh, commendable quality for a rake. In terms of the technicalities there was also a presence of a set scenes which were uh, quite parodied in most of the uh, plays of those times. The supreme example was uh, that of a, a proviso scene. A proviso scene uh, included a definite set of uh, rules in order to facilitate a balanced relationship or a dialogue through which a kind of uh, setting of parameters was done in terms of having an equal marriage. So this was primarily a discussion between the couple uh, in order to bring about a certain kind of a balance in their uh, relationships. We find this sort of proviso scenes being part of most of the uh, uh, dominant restoration comedy of those times. The other significant features included the, uh, the uh, uh, quick wet, uh, repartee, intrigue, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, local gossip also built into these plays and the plays also had very um, intricate parallel plots and this also was because these playwrights you like to challenge the uh, courtly audience, the upper class elite audience. Uh, it, there was also an element of farce, uh, we find a trace of the comedy of manners, there was social satire built in and we also noticed that humour in the comedies were of mostly of provincial nature. So it, uh, uh, it was more local and it failed to make sense outside the immediate circles. Who were the most important people of the restoration comedy? The big five of the restoration comedy were George Etheridge and William Y. Curley who were also co-twits, William Congreve, George Farquhar and John uh, Vanbrook. And George Farquhar was incidentally the only professional playwright, the others mostly wrote for their uh, uh, fashionable and friendly circles. Let us take a, uh, a very brief look at each of these uh, plays. George Etheridge he engaged with the themes of love and intrigue and also of uh, vanity and he also tried to build into his uh, plot structure a lot of uh, details related to amorous adventures of the protagonist. And uh, one of his famous plays uh, was titled she would if she could this was uh, staged in 1688 and it was a huge success. Uh, there is this particular lady protagonist Lady Cockwood uh, who was characterized as an amorous lady who pursues the hero. In Pepe's diary it was noted that uh, at least 1000 people were turned away for lack of adequate seats on the opening night of this place she would if she could. So this was a kind of popularity that uh, restoration comedy enjoyed during that time. And the uh, another significant uh, play of uh, Etheridge was Man of Mode uh, in 1676 an earlier one. In this there is this particular character of uh, Sir Fopling Futter. This character is considered as a prototype of the dandy who was to become uh, very popular in the European stage at a later point of time. In terms of the, uh, the names of the characters used we would find that there are these interesting coinages that most of the dramatists continue to use during the time. It was also considered uh, as an instant hit in terms of these peculiar names that were given to the characters in the play. The second most important playwright of this period was William Congreve. Uh, his important uh, plays were 
the old bachelor, the double dealer and love for love and also the most successful one was the way of the world. Most of his works, uh, they were the, uh, they, they included brilliant dialogues and he also relied on set characters and themes but in spite of these uh, uh, predictability which was associated with most of his plays, he also displayed an exemplary sense of dramatic craft and uh, there is also this critique against uh, Congress plays that uh, the witty conversations in his works were so uh, engaging that they almost overshadowed the movement of the plot as well. A Way of the World was one of the most successful plays of Congreve and also perhaps the most uh, one of the most important plays of the period as well. Uh, staged in uh, 1700, it was about the love relationship between this couple uh, Millament and uh, Mirabel. The dialogue between uh, this uh, couple, uh, it was considered as a very good example of the proviso scene uh, which was dominant in the restoration comedy. This uh, was about the theme of uh, bargaining between the sexes prior to marriage. This was hugely enjoyed at that point of time and con uh, continued to catch the fancy of the you know, people even at a later point of time. In most of his works, uh, uh, we find that Congreve was more concerned with form and dramatic structure than with theme and we also find that his characters were overdone and uh, unidimensional in nature. So, they failed to appeal uh, to a larger audience outside uh, his circles or outside the uh, age in which the, this uh, drama was popular. Uh, and apart from the many limitations that Congreve's uh, plays had, we find that the portrait of villains and other lowly characters were more uh, commendable than that of the protagonist in most of his uh, works. William Wycherley was perhaps the most noted in terms of uh, dramatic genius and technique. Even Hudson makes a, a notable and worthy mention of Wycherley in his uh, uh, literary history. Uh, his works mostly focused on women's hypocrisy and also uh, there was this limitation that many of the portraits even uh, were on the verge of uh, uh, being a farce. His plays was, uh, were considered uh, unacceptable in terms of the kind of dialogues and the kind of uh, themes that it, uh, it in included. Uh, it especially had a lot of innuendos, uh, a lot of double entrees. Uh, it, it was a phrase open to two interpretations, one predominantly uh, sexual in nature. And there were also these lengthy asides which uh, spoke about many things related to uh, sexuality, about things which were taboo in, uh, during those times and also about the relationship between men and women. Country Wife was the most successful play of uh, uh, Wycherley. This was also considered and it continues to be considered as the typical restoration uh, comedy which celebrated amoral uh, activities, uh, it uh, spoke about seduction and hypocrisy as well. Uh, in this uh, play, The Country Wife, we find that a particular character named Horner and his activities are lauded with a lot of humour and this, uh, in, in this play, this uh, character who, try, who pretends to be a, a eunuch, he secures admission to private spaces where women are and he manages to seduce a lot of women and this is considered as a commendable kind of quality and the play continued to celebrate this sort of uh, quality so to speak which was present in this protagonist. And there is also this portrayal of Mrs. Pinch wife who claims to be uh, innocent but also falls uh, as prey. Uh, to the advances of uh, this protagonist and also ends up cheating uh, her husband. And we find that most of these characters were archetypes in restoration comedy and we find them uh, getting repeated in many of the uh, plays at a later point as well. T talking about this play in particular, The Country Wife, Trevelyan makes this very interesting remark. In no other age would such a plot motive have appealed to any English audience. So, at a later point, many historians were even quite in awe with the fact that this sort of uh, comedy and this so sort of uh, theme structure and plot structure, one after the other, that it continued to enthrall an audience which was otherwise not in encouragement of such kind of plot structure or such kind of thematic uh, things. And uh, at least this was the opinion of most of the uh, dominant historians and literary historians of a later point. The other significant work by Wycherley was uh, The Plain Dealer. And moving on, let us uh, take a look at the dominant works of uh, John uh, Vanbra. Uh, he was an important uh, figure uh, in the sense that he uh, mostly reworked plays from the uh, Spanish and uh, French plays. His significant plays were The Relapse and The Provoked uh, Wife. His work uh, had uh, rich uh, characters. Uh, it was also built with uh, body uh, comedy. There was crude wit. There was also an overwhelming cynicism of uh, all these kinds of things which were happening around and he also caricatured marital troubles in his uh, play. Uh, in fact, because of the bodiness and because of the bold language which was part of uh, uh, Van Brewer's plays, uh, we find uh, Jeremy Collier uh, singling out Van Brewer in his uh, treatise against uh, the immorality of the stage and in that sense he also had uh, a lot of public appeal during that time and also was uh, uh, quite an eyesore in the sight of uh, 
uh, many like uh, Jeremy Collier. George Farquhar, another significant uh, writer of the time, he had written seven comedies and a farce. He also believed very staunchly that a play without a cuckold, a view or a cockett was poor entertainment. So we can uh, almost imagine the kind of uh, plot structure which uh, he celebrated in most of his plays. His important works were The Recruiting Officer, in which he satirizes the way in which class dominates over affections and even relationships, and The Twin Rivals, in which a younger brother uh, almost uh, steals his older brother's title and estate. And the other significant work was The Buell Stratagem. And we also find that his drama, uh, it serves as a bridge between restoration drama and the later 17th uh, century drama of sentiment. And moving on, it's important to highlight the presence of Afra Ben here as well. She was perhaps the only and the most successful women playwright of the times. Uh, her important comedies were The Dutch Lover and The Rover. She was uh, criticized for her unfeminine themes and portraits and obviously for her unfeminine kind of lifestyle and unconventional uh, lifestyle that she uh, led during those times. Afra Ben was very popular with the theatre enthusiasts of those times and she was incidentally the first woman to earn her uh, life by writing for the theatre and that's in the first professional successful playwright of those uh, times. And in her plays there were a lot of sharp critiques of uh, masculinity and power. Uh, she also pointed, highlighted the unequal education opportunities which women received during that age. Uh, in her play The Widow Ranter, we find the theme of colonization coming back, uh, just like her fiction Orunoko, which, which we took a look at in the previous session. So she continued to be a strong uh, critique of uh, uh, the colonization and also about the patriarchal system of the period and we also find a sense of seriousness getting built into uh, her comedies unlike the restoration comedy written uh, mostly by the uh, male dramatists. If we look at restoration uh, tragedy it was equally artificial and also uh, it was not very fashionable because the wealthy elites did not uh, enjoy the tragedy much, uh, they enjoyed only the comedy of the times. And the important works were Dryden's All for Love based on Antony and Cleopatra and Congreve's The Morning Bride. We also find uh, a couple of writers such as Nathaniel Lee, Thomas Otway, uh, etc. also staging uh, tragedies over there but they were not hugely popular and uh, most of these works they were primarily done for the stage and they had very little uh, value as literature. We do not even find them getting adequate attention at a, a later point. Uh, and uh, looking at the elements of restoration tragedy, uh, it's important to note that it never achieved the same stature or literary perfection as that of uh, uh, restoration comedy. It was not popular then. It uh, never regained popularity at a later point either. Uh, heroic drama was the most common kind of uh, representation during those times and heroic tragedy as it was depicted in the restoration period it was primarily the conflict between love and honor or between love and duty. And we also note that there was no place for heroic virtues given the kind of decadence of the times and also about the uh, the, the, uh, the uh, prolific uh, kind of presence of uh, celebration of vice in the restoration comedy of those times. We find that there was no place for heroic virtues at all in the tragedy. Uh, some critics even talk about this age as an unheroic age and the concept of uh, uh, heroism itself was very limited and artificial and it was also quite uh, an inflated and exaggerated kind of uh, representation. Uh, tragedy, unlike uh, the Elizabethan and the Jacobian uh, concepts and representation, uh, tragedy in restoration drama was the result of uh, failure and not the result of an overarching ambition. We also find an excessive use of melodrama and histrionics taking a dominant place in uh, the tragedy of the restoration time. There was also a limited concern with social uh, stability which uh, did not get much attention due to the flawed uh, thematic structure or due to the uh, unimpressive kind of uh, presentation of these uh, drama. We find Dryden coming up with this uh, particular essay on heroic plays in order to defend the uh, tragedies uh, written during those times. He also defended the extravagance of action in uh, these works. But apart from the, the kind of effective defense that it could put up uh, during those times, Dryden's work was more noted as a, a notable work of literary, con literary criticism and a major contribution towards the growth of literary criticism at later point of time. Uh, perhaps the most important uh, dramatist of uh, restoration tragedy was Dryden himself. He composed quite a few plays of uh, uh, tragedy which were also considered important even at a later point of time. Uh, Tyrannic Love or the Royal Martyr in 1669, the conquest of Granada which had, had two parts. It was also about a national uh, strife that England had uh, encountered during those times. 
uh, All for Love is perhaps the most successful of his uh, um, writings and also perhaps the most successful uh, tragedy of those times. This was adapted from Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra. Its popularity continued even into the 19th century. Uh, the other important uh, tragedy that he uh, produced was The Indian Queen. The other significant playwrights of the period who uh, focused more on tragedy were Thomas Otway. His works uh, included The Orphan and The Venice Preserved. Nicholas Rowe wrote seven tragedies altogether, including The Ambitious Stepmother, uh, Tamerlane, and The Fair Penitent. And uh, some of his characters were also said to uh, have uh, inspired the later novelists, particularly uh, Samuel Richardson's The Character of Lovelace in his novel Clarissa and Henry Fielding's uh, Miss uh, Matthews in his uh, novel Amelia. They were uh, said to have inspired by uh, some of the characters portrayed by Nicholas Rowe. Uh, Rowe also had a particular set of uh, writings later termed as Shri tragedies. Uh, two prominent of them were Jane Shore and Lady Jane. It included vivid descriptions of female uh, distress. The popularity and significance of these plays were, however, heavily overshadowed by the presence of the restoration comedy, uh, which was enjoyed uh, by, the, by the people and also promoted hugely by the court of, the Char court of Charles II. Uh, Nathaniel Lee was another significant writer who also had collaborated with Dryden. With this, we come to almost the end of this session. It's also at the time to make a quick evaluation of restoration drama and also figure out what happened after that. This uh, sort of celebration of the profligacy and vices of the time, also the kind of unacceptability that the restoration comedy had, it was only the beginning of a decline which uh, went on uh, until about the early 18th century. And we also find that during this period, the people's attention turned to fictional prose rather than drama. And also many uh, feel that perhaps this sort of uh, uh, repetitiveness in uh, theme and uh, plot and also this uh, predictability in terms of uh, the comedy, people were also quite uh, fed up with this sort of uh, repeated performances. And the attack on the immorality of the stage, it also had a profound influence on the uh, people and we also find them continually attacking the restoration comedy which was prevalent. And another important point was that since it was a mostly a metropolitan kind of literature and without any kind of uh, provincial uh, element built into it, we do not find the whole of uh, England supporting uh, uh, these sort of uh, plays which were prominent in restoration drama. Uh, in fact, plays were performed, uh, let me reiterate, only in London and the rest of England uh, was completely left out from this form of uh, drama. So in that sense, it could not even be called as uh, a national kind of uh, literature or a national kind of uh, uh, drama during the restoration period. With the Theatre Licensing Act of six, 1737, we also find that this sort of uh, dramatic activity uh, also comes to an end. Uh, Lord Chamberlain, who was appointed as the official government uh, censor, he uh, came up with this act and it also had the power to grant or refuse license to any play on religious, moral or political grounds. Uh, so with this, we also find restoration drama in uh, a certain uh, ways, particularly the restoration comedy coming to an end. Uh, but however, it is of supreme importance to note the kind of dramatic activity which uh, happened after the uh, restoration and particularly after, re after the reopening of the theatres during the time of the restoration. So with this, we come to an end of this session. Thank you for listening and we look forward to seeing you in the next session.